For over three decades, Ken Burns has chronicled all parts of American history through his camera lens. He's known for his deep dives in very well-reported documentaries and his use of archival footage. In his latest work, The U.S. and the Holocaust, he focuses on the U.S. response to one of the greatest humanitarian crises in the 20th century. We tell ourselves stories as a nation. One of the stories we tell ourselves is that we're a land of immigrants. But in moments of crisis, it becomes very hard for us to live up to those stories. The Holocaust was beyond belief. People just disappeared. The primary goal was to get to the United States. But the golden door was not wide open. We are challenged as Americans to think about what we would have done, what we could have done, what we should have done. In our better moments, we are very good people, but that's not all there is to this story. Uh, Mr. Burns, when you started working on this documentary, were you aware how timely the series would be once it would air? You know, Mark Twain, our great writer, once said, or is supposed to have said, that history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. And there hasn't been a film that I've worked on over the last nearly 50 years that hasn't rhymed in the present. And that's because human nature doesn't change. Human behavior doesn't change the same you know, degrees of virtue and villainy of greed and generosity exist. So every film rhymes. What was surprising, what was startling is that as we began work in 2015, um, this, I knew it would be speaking to the present, but I had no idea by the time I was finished how directly it would be speaking to the, the rise of authoritarianism, the rise of anti-Semitic um, rhetoric, the rise of hate speech, the, the kinds of things that you see in the lead up from the American side and also from the German side to what happened in the 1930s and then what we now call the Holocaust. Talking about a surprise, is there anything which really surprised you while you were working on this documentary? Every day was a revelation, sad, uh, sometimes heroic, uh, painful, heartbreaking uh, investigation. And in the United States, at least, we say the word six million of the six million murdered. Um, it, it has no meaning. There's a kind of opacity to it. And what the writer Daniel Mendelssohn says in our film, and as I think Germany has done so well, is to try to particularize it, to understand these are individual human beings who live lives as fully as you live yours and as I try to live mine. And that if you can particularize these individual stories, then you have a chance to sort of you know, pull the curtain back from that, that, that opacity of six million and begin to understand what was lost, what symphonies weren't written, what cures for diseases didn't happen, what gardens weren't tended, what children weren't raised with love, what, what, what ideas weren't formulated and discussed. And that's, that's part of our job as storytellers is, is to communicate that big, gigantic, glaring, empty space, the void of, of the people who were murdered in the context of not just the Holocaust, which is usually done, but in the context of the Second World War, in which, of course, tens and tens of millions of people uh, lost their lives. But this was six million who were deliberately murdered only because they were Jewish. I find it so interesting um, and so well done in your documentary how you kind of um, develop the whole discussion about migration and which role it played in the American response to the Holocaust. The anxieties about urbanization, about unlettered, untutored, relatively uneducated peoples coming in in large numbers, the sense that disease was a problem. All of these worries were amalgamated into a belief that immigrants caused these problems, and thus immigration should be held down. What I find so striking when I watch your documentary is that the rhetoric around migration and immigration seems to be the same now than it was 80 years ago. The, the first step in the playbook of authoritarians is to make an other of somebody else. There's only 
But the thing I've learned is this could be called us and the Holocaust, right? Because I've been making films about the U.S. for nearly 50 years, but I've also been making films about us, that that lowercase two-letter plural pronoun, us, and all the intimacy of us, that, all the complexity, uh, the contradiction, the controversy, uh, and the majesty of the United States. And so I've tried to tell that complete picture, and what you find over and over again is that the same things aren't recurring, not happening again. History is never repeating itself, but human beings are the same. And so what that tells you is what a powerful teacher uh, history could be, and that how, with regard to your question, how much we are always in the first page one of the authoritarian playbook is make somebody to blame, right? And immigrants, people who are other, are like that. And it's so interesting that immigrants to the United States who had themselves been discriminated against in the 19th century or the early 20th century turned themselves into discriminators against the more recent uh, uh, arrivals. And that is just the way we sort of pass it all down. And, and, and at that time, there is, of course, this pseudoscience of eugenics, which is giving a kind of uh, a scientific underpinning or rationale to this completely fraudulent that you can there's a hierarchy of races and that the northern european nordic hitler would have said aryan people are at the highest part of the rank and that in, in descending orders jews were ca classified as uncouth asiatics there's only one race the human race and the idea that that some people could be better than other races could be better than uh, is just is absurd and and it and it it doesn't hold up, but it it had has such durability in our minds that if we could only say that the problems that are, that are happening to me that are inevitable to any human life are therefore the blame of somebody else. Anti-Semitism intensified. The automobile pioneer Henry Ford blamed Jews for everything from Lincoln's assassination to the change he thought he detected in the flavor of his favorite candy bar. He bought himself a weekly newspaper, the Dearborn Independent, and used it to spread his anti-Semitic propaganda. In a series of 91 weekly articles called The International Jew, he promoted the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a Russian hoax that claimed there was a global Jewish conspiracy to take over the world. Maybe, Mr. Burns, you can talk a little bit about the media landscape in the U.S. in the 30s and 40s and how this is reflected today. So, first of all, let me just prepare it by saying that during the 1930s and 40s is the greatest economic dislocation in the history of the world, followed by the greatest human cataclysm in humankind, right, in all of human history. That is to say, the Depression and the Second World War. So Americans are distracted and Americans get their stuff from lots of different sources, but there are prevalent, very outspoken anti-Semitic voices. And so that's in the air, as is the nativism and anti-immigrant sentiment that comes from a depression, that comes from a country that's, you know, has treats blacks as second-class citizens. German jurists in 1935 study our Jim Crow exclusionary laws in Southern states to model a less stringent definition of Jews to in anti-discrimination laws out of Nuremberg in, in 1935. Uh, Hitler is impressed with the way we've, you know, obliterated our native population. He wants to do to the way we did to our wild west, to the wild east, because he does not see the Slavic people and the Jews and the Orthodox in the way as people. He sees them as stateless non-entities that give him the breathing room, the Lebensraum, I'll say that poorly for your German audience, uh, that um, that he wants to have the breathing space as his thousand-year Reich grows. You know, it's, it's, you know, this is the same sad story. And unfortunately, you know, what it requires for it to take place is for good people to acquiesce and to not do anything. What also comes across in your documentary very clearly is that the Nazi support came from, from the average people. The fragility of civilized behavior is the one thing you really learn. Because these people, who we now see in these photographs, these sepia photographs, and they're receding into time, they're no different, no different from us. 
You look at your neighbors, the people at the dry cleaners, the waiters in the restaurant, that's who these people were. Don't kid yourself. I think when times are really difficult, when there's a lot of change and there's inequality, it is in the interests of those in the highest levels of power, business, government, whatever, to set the people at the bottom against each other. And this is what, you know, the National Socialists did so beautifully. They, they toned down anti-Semitism, stepped up street violence to try to convince the German people that, that civil war was imminent and that the Bolsheviks, meaning the Jews, were causing this, and that we, the great German nation, didn't lose the First World War. We must have been sabotaged from within. So you blame victims there. We're in the middle of this depression. That's only because of that. So you take a step backwards and you think, if I were a person who is interested in being in the most vibrant place on earth, that is to say, where the, the finest music new music is being composed, where the cinema is at the highest level of its uh, achievement, where painting is going in new directions, where architecture is, is new, where ideas are there, where sexual liberation is happening, where women are engaging themselves. You would do no better than to go to Berlin in 1930, 31 or 32. But I tell you, in 33, it's gone. It's gone. And there are 3,000 articles speaking to what Americans knew or didn't know. 3,000 articles in 1933 alone about what's going on in Germany, the mistreatment of Jews, the isolation of Jews, just in the first year of Adolf Hitler coming to power. Uh, sir, if the United States would have joined the war earlier, obviously millions of lives like that, for example, from Schmil Jaeger, who is portrayed uh, in your piece, could have been saved. As hard as Schmiel Jaeger had tried, he had been unable to get himself, his wife Esther, and his four daughters out of occupied Poland to America. German troops had reached his hometown of Bolochow in the summer of 1941. Within weeks, his daughter Ruhola was murdered. That was only the beginning. Well, you know, joining the war earlier w was not a possibility. It, it, it was not a possibility. Franklin Roosevelt knew it was happening and he heroically got the neutrality acts revoked that allowed us to provide arms and material to particularly Britain, but then later the Soviet Union and other allied uh, uh, forces. Um, it took the attack of Pearl Harbor to end the isolation. And then the greatest gift that Adolf Hitler ever gave uh, Franklin Roosevelt, was to declare war on January 11th. If he hadn't have done that, there would have still been no momentum, political momentum in the United States to liberate Europe. But once Hitler declared war on us, then it was different. The main point, though, is that during the 1930s, when escape was still possible, we could have gotten out another million people, at least. And we didn't. Through bureaucratic red tape, through virulent anti-Semitism, through the kind of rule changing that I was describing before. That's on us, that's on us. There could be a million people. And then you could have also gotten them out, might have made those choke points like Lisbon and Casablanca and other ports that had not yet been taken over, um, might have allowed another stream in that could have gotten other people out. And maybe by us taking in more, we could have been a much more effective and persuasive actor on the national scene, on the international scene to get other countries to take them. Because we'd say, please take more. And they say, you're not taking, we don't want to take it. We don't want to have, you know, a Jewish problem, as they'd say. Ken Burns, what do you hope people will learn from this documentary? You know, thank you for asking that. But I, I have to tell you, I'm a storyteller. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm interested in stories. And I think Lynn Novick and Sarah Botstein, my two co-directors, and I know Jeffrey Ward, the writer of this, would agree with me, that our idea is to tell a complex story with, I mean, we've worked for seven and a half years to really have an intertwined narrative. It's, it's very, very complex. And to make that work and, and watchable uh, is is what we do for a living. And then, you know, the novelist Richard Powers says, the best arguments in the world won't change a single person's point of view. The only thing that can do that is a good story. So whether this changes you at your heart 
or changes you at the edges or changes you very little or a lot or not at all or whatever. That's really what happens. Once the film is done, it's no longer ours. It's yours. It's everyone's. And and it, it becomes, I, I would hope that it would wake people up to the fact that democracies are really fragile instruments. Um, my previous film was on uh, Benjamin Franklin, and he's one of the architects of the American Constitution, all of its tragic compromises and all of its good compromises. And when he finished that, the, it, basically in September of 1787, a woman asked him, and of course the Constitution did not treat a woman in, at all. A woman had no rights. She was non-existent. She was stateless in a way. Um, said, what have you created, a, a monarchy or a republic? And he said, a republic, if you can keep it. And, you know, from 246 years through the Civil War and through the Depression and through the Second World War, those institutions have held. Not, not sometimes very well, but they've held. And now they seem under assault. And the basic elements of that, which would be free and fair elections, the last one was as free and as fair as there has ever been in the history of the United States, but a huge tens of millions of Americans don't believe that happened through misinformation, through outright lies. Um, the uh, peaceful transfer of power, which the United States has been the envy of every country on earth because of that unbroken set of a peaceful transfer of power. Yep, I lost, you take over. The American people speak, it's their will. Didn't happen this time. And, and then I think the independence of the judiciary, very important. And as I think you brought up quite correctly, a free and independent media. We look at Putin's Russia and we understand the way in which a population can be so completely driven by the fact that they're into opinions that are completely the opposite of what reality is. You can believe that up is down if a media is telling you this on television and radio and in the print every single day. And so it's important to maintain um, that the fourth estate as our, you know, as this kind of protection against these, these essential liberties. And I think that's what the film tells you. And I hope that people have that reinforced, just the fragility of the institutions that we think the fragility of the institutions we take for granted. Ken Burns, thank you very much. I sure hope that your documentary gets many, many viewers. Me as a German, I'm thankful, very thankful, and I, I learned so much, and I'm sure all our viewers around the world would do so if they watch it. So I really only can highly recommend to do so. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you. <laughs>